Thank you for coming and joining us for this overview, this brief presentation. I was call my uh, presentation brief, but uh, they could go on and on and on all day, actually. But this, this actually will be a introductory presentation, a brief introduction to Shetana Tur. It's broken down into two parts, basically. Shetana Tur, introduction. And then introduction to the disciplines and practice of the Unitarian priests and priestesses. And this is a basically a shortened program from a, a longer presentation that I've done to to other other you know, for other presentations. The because in this particular program I was going to concentrate on introducing the philosophy and teachings of the priests and priestesses of ancient Canada. So that one third of the lecture, of the presentation, is on Shetana Ter, which I think most of you are, at least to some degree, familiar with it, because you read some of my materials, some of the books. And uh, the two thirds are going to be devoted to the priests and priestesses. Okay. So we're going to go through the first section. That says an overview, for those of you who may not have heard anything. Uh, in particular about the Shetana Ter, what it is, what are its origins, and then we'll move forward into the, the hymn, the disciplines of the hymn. continue here. This is the book that we will be discussing for the first part of the program, uh, the Shetana series, the Egyptian Mystery book series has three volumes, and this is the first one in the, those volumes. Uh, the Shetana principles have been discussed in all the other books, but this series puts the Shetana teachings themselves into context and in an organized and listed fashion so it's easily accessible. The other books, like I say, take different aspects of the Nectarian philosophy and expound on those. Uh, like one deals with the Asar resurrection, one deals with the Bazinian philosophy, and one deals with Amor. Uh, there are different aspects of the philosophy that the other books go into details into. But these books, th these series, the books that I've written in the last four years, the last four years, especially this series, the Kemetic Diet, and the African Origins, these are now primary books for our tradition. Uh, they're written to be, to be so, to be reference books, as it were, for the tradition of Shaitan and Ter. Institute has been the, or has become the Sima University 
that is the aspect of organization where the teachings are purveyed, where studies are done, where teachings are put forth, the publishing of the books, uh, the university degree that we have now, the bookstore, the, all that aspect of organization is handled through that. And eventually you're going to see a, um, a website specifically for every section of of uh, organization that I'm talking about. Right now there's basically one website with three sections. But now we're going to divide it into whole sections for each each aspect of the organization so it can be more accessible and, and more easily organized for people. And the other side is the temple side. So they, these two sides work together. On one side we train, on the other side we do the performance of the rituals, performance of the teaching, of the actual practices. Uh, and this side is where the priesthood is. The priesthood is the foundation, it is the basis of our program, of our temple. Spiritual counseling occurs through that side, initiation, spiritual worship programs, and so on and so forth. Of course, these are not mutually exclusive. There are aspects of our organization that work together. Uh, and uh, one of the things that, that we'll announce it, or we'll talk about at the end of the program, is the the annual conference uh, that will be occurring in December, where both of these aspects will be will be uh, will be brought forth uh, in a in a seminar um, retreat program that we're planning, a week long program that we're planning. Now, this section, uh, like I said, we're just going to go through quickly. I'm not going to belabor the point, but as, as you usually put this so that people can have a common idea of, at least in this lecture hall, so that we can know where we are coming from. Many people have heard of different traditions, Buddhism, Taoism, even African religions, Yoruba, Akan, Christianity, Islam. And I know you've heard many things in this program this weekend. I know you've heard things that you have read in different places. And I was, as you were, at, at one time, in doing researches and going through many different philosophies and teachings and so on and so forth. And in my early years of research, it was clearly evident to me that we're coming back to one place, and that place was Cameron. Now, just saying that, it doesn't, that, that is a, a nice thing to say, but it doesn't really help you. If you understand what I mean, philosophically, there's a nice idea, everything comes back to Canada, everything comes back to Africa, but what does that mean in context of how are you supposed to live your life? How are you supposed to adopt the philosophy? so that it can be helpful to you in your life today. It doesn't matter that somebody was rich 100 years ago, some ancestor of yours, if the money is lost, how does it help you? What you need to do know is how that ancestor learned how to make that money so that you can do it now, so you can have that wealth for yourself now. And that's what I'm concerned with. As a philosopher, as a priest of the town, I'm not interested in the historical aspects themselves, per se, as an end in themselves. That's a nice thing. But considering ourselves as the first creators of religion, creators of language, creators of art, all those kind of things, that's a nice romantic idea. But it doesn't really help us. Because you're going to go out there and you're going to still be downtrodden, you're going to still be uh, spat upon, you're going to still be uh, at, the, at the low end of society. How does that help you? What we need to do is to empower ourselves with a philosophy, a teaching, and the disciplines that allow ourselves to transform ourselves into the high human beings that our ancestors were. And that is what I'm concerned about. And that is the part of the priestly disciplines that we're going to be talking about later on. But moving from here, this is, I like to show this, this particular slide because it gives you uh, an indication in no uncertain terms of the ancient nature of the comedic culture and philosophy. This monument, I'm sure everybody recognizes as the Great Sphinx. 
And if you look at the enclosure of the Sphinx and the Sphinx itself, you see certain striations, certain damage in the walls. And this kind of damage, geologists have shown time and time again, this kind of damage occurs through water erosion. And this kind of damage does not occur in any other kind of way. The striation is you come down uh, in a vertical fashion and around into the stone, uh, cutting through the, the softer stone uh, in more in, in the patient and leaving the harder stone. The latest period in history where there was sufficient water in Northeast Africa to cause this kind of damage was somewhere between seven to 10,000 BC. That means that the Sphinx was created before that period in order for it to receive this kind of damage over a period of thousands of years. Are you following that? Mm -hmm. There is no older monument, spirit, religious monument in the world that tracks a spiritual philosophy from that date through to so, I'll say the present, but let's just say to the, the period of, of the common era, shall we say. And we're looking at just that period alone, not in the last 2,000 years. You're looking at from 10,000 BC to the common era, towards the end of Egyptian culture and civilization, that is 10,000 years at least of Mediterranean culture and civilization. The iconography that you see here is the same iconography that carries throughout the rest of the Kemetic culture down for 10,000 years. There's no other civilization in history that can say that it has that kind of longevity or that kind of history. There's no other monument in the world that is older. It doesn't matter what you may hear, what you may say, I suggest that you go and if anybody says anything otherwise, I suggest that you go and re do the research for yourself and verify what I'm saying. Now, I like to say that because that should give you an indication of the ancient nature of the culture. That in and of itself is not a legitimizing aspect for the culture and civilization and philosophy. You, think you, should, you would think that's strange that I would say something like that, but that is not what I consider the legitimizing aspect of Because you can have many ancient things. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily good just because it's ancient, right? The proof of the pudding is in the eating. The proof of the committed culture and the philosophy is when you do it, and when you practice it, what happens to you? Do, you? do you tap into the ancient power? Do you tap into the philosophy? Do you tap into the source of self, the spiritual enlightenment? And that's what this, the Sphinx really represents. The cobra on the top of, of the forehead, the leonine mane, all these are specifically comedic motifs of harnessing the line power and bringing it through to the opening of the third eye. And that is what I'm interested in. And furthermore, what I'm trying to get at by talking to you about the, the age is that there are those philosophies or teachers that try to say that because their philosophy is younger, that they try to make that into a virtue. And I'm also saying that that, that does not make a virtue out of a philosophy either. You can have something new that is also junk. Just because something came, something, you can see just, uh, it's an analogy, you may not, I'll draw, I'll draw the, the lines for you quickly here. Um, like every 5, 10, 20 years, uh, the, you, you see some, some evidence or some conclusion coming out of the, the American Medical Association. And then two or three years down the line, five years, ten years, you see a retraction of that. And these are supposed to be the people who know everything. They have all the evidences, they have all the studies, they have all the, the wherewithal to figure out what the truth is, and they have to be changing themselves constantly. There are certain, certain 
principles that are universal and that are transcendental and that do not change. Now, if a philosophy is going to co-opt certain principles from other traditions, that in itself also does not legitimize that tradition. Like if you know what co-optation is, when you we have a kind of music and then you know, somebody else takes it over and says it's theirs, that's clocking that music. It doesn't mean that you develop the music. It means that you're playing it, it means that you're using it, it means that you stole it, <laughs> essentially. And in that stealing process, when you change the name, you may change a few notes here and there, you may change this and that, that tends to distort what you have co-opted. You know what I'm talking about. Kemetic teaching has been taken by the Christians, by the Muslims, by, by Hindus, by Buddhists, by many, and it has been transformed, and has been changed. You can see some basic principles that I've written about it. The African origins I lay it all out. And also, furthermore, I would say that following a tradition with the idea of discovering truth in a scripture is one of the most erroneous ideas of philosophy and spirituality and religion. And that idea does not come in until recent times, until 2,000, 2,500 years ago. The philosophy and the teaching is in you. And the, the writings are reflecting a way for you to discover that. There is no scripture that you can say that just by reading it, you're going to have the truth, and this is something that leads you to a better knowledge. But in order for you to have that, there have to be three things. There has to be an authentic teaching. And like I say, a corporate teaching, I don't consider an authentic teaching. You have to have an authentic teacher, someone who can teach you those mysteries of life. And you yourself have to be an authentic aspirant to learn that teaching. Be a pure vessel, in other words. And these are the kind of issues that we need to be considering when you're looking for a spiritual philosophy to follow. Change Excuse me. Okay, so how do you know what the teacher is about? The teacher is about. You want to check it at the end? We'll take questions at the end, okay. just so we can get okay. through. Sure. <laughs> um, and it may be covered if it's not. Good. And this is just to put to put it in a in a linear form for you. Let's do another two points. Kemetic philosophy, Shatanatur, starts here. Or it does not start here. This is the earliest record we have of its existence that, that we can verify. Actually, we have other evidences, but I don't present those because they can be challenged. This is irrefutable. You know what irrefutable means, right? It means that you listen to it, you gotta shut up. <laughs> because you can't, you can't complain, you can't, you can't argue with it. You can't argue with uh, geological evidence. It is there. You can't say anything about it. It's like scriptural things, you can argue. Uh, uh, you, know, you can argue about philosophical issues, where this comes from, where it comes from, you can argue with geological evidence. And so 10,000 BC. The next culture, philosophy, that brings in a advanced philosophical treatise of religion really comes from the, the Aryan culture in India. Anything that resembles a extensive philosophy. What I mean by that is that you can have like spiritual symbols, like maybe there was a, a an icon here of infinity, and maybe it means something, maybe it doesn't. But I'm talking about a scripturally based philosophy where the, the teaching is laid out for you in written form and is explained for you, and that does not occur. It begin to occur, shall we say, until the era of the of the the Iron Vedas, and that occurs 
about uh, 2000 BC. Then later on, at about 1000 BC, we begin to see the beginning scriptures of the Bible. The Bible was written over a period of between 1000 BC and about 200 BC, over a period of 800 years. Several scriptures that were brought together and then called the Torah. They were written by different writers, and this is shown by, by Judaic scholars, you don't have to believe me about it. Same thing with, with the, the Bible, which occurs a couple hundred years later. The Gospels of the Bible and different, different books of the Bible did not appear until at least 50 to 75 years after the death of supposedly where Jesus was supposed to be alive. So this would be like uh, if somebody dies today, and then in the year 2050, somebody starts writing about them, who the person was, what they did, all that kind of thing. How would they know? I'll leave that for now. I just want to give you an idea. And here, 500 BC, this is where Buddhism and Taoism and classical Greek philosophy, Pythagoreanism, all that comes in. And there, we, of course, show evidences of the, the drinking from the waters of the Nile. In fact, the Bible itself says Jesus and his family went to, went to Egypt, Abraham went to Egypt. Moses was in Egypt. Joseph was in Egypt. Why is this all this emphasis on going to Egypt? Muhammad went to Egypt. Why did they all have to go to Egypt? And then they, they denigrate Egypt afterwards. When they leave Egypt, they denigrate. So, it's a ridiculous notion. And there, there's a, a parallel, you can cuss it. There's a parallel in Indian culture where, and I talk about this in the book, extensively, African origins, where you have the Aryan period developing into the Upanishadic period. And the Aryan god, Indra, was subdued by the Upanishadic god, Vishnu. And what that means is that Upanishadic Hindu age is taking over and surpassing the Aryan age. So mythologically, the god, what god defeats the other. So here you have god, of the Jews defeating the God of the Egyptians, right? So and what occurs many times is when people want to, to usurp a tradition, usurp the prestige of tradition, you say that the God has defeated your God. This is all cultural, mythological, has nothing, no basis in history. This is what I'm getting at. The story of Moses, all that is. Here, very quickly, is uh, who, who saw this picture the other night? Okay, you're excluded from here. <laughs> <laughs> you're excluded from Those of you who have not seen this. That's not fun. That's not fun. You're, you're all, those of you who did not see this picture, there are two groups of people in here excluding him right now. This group of people. Some of them are Nubian, and some of them are Egyptian. Can you tell me who the Egyptians are, who the Nubians are? The Nubians are the darker. Nubians are the darker skin. Yeah. And what do you say? Okay, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> these are Egyptian young men, young princes, and these are Nubians. They're bringing free law friends. You see that there, some of them are dark, some of them are lighter, some of them are dark, some of them are lighter. They're the same. The Nubians and the Egyptians are the same. And there are several pictures like this that you can find. So, uh, you know, the idea behind this picture is that these are African people. These are not just African black people. They're not just African people. They're black African people. This is a black philosophy, a black consciousness teaching that was brought forward. That's what this picture is all about. This is a, a modern day Nubian man. You have several of them who, who live in Aswan, in southern Egypt, and they you get both rides with them. But again, what he even says is that if this is what a Nubian looked like looks like now. This picture was taken like about uh, seven years ago or so. What did it look like then? At least it looked like him. Yeah. Father, what are you getting? 
But there, there were different hues, there were different, there were lighter skin, there were darker. This is what Egyptians all that's not. Okay, you definitely will not find a uh, Middle Eastern hue or color or, or uh, a European. This is an African, that's basically what's behind this picture. Okay, before we get into what Nectarianism is, let's talk about who created Nectarianism. Every philosophy, every religion has a founder, doesn't it? Usually you look at who founded it, who brought it forth, who created it. And our founder, our creator, is Lord Kepri. Is Lord Kepri, you know who he is? By the headdress, which is a scarab. And Lord Kepri is the creator. But also our scriptures say that Lord Kepri brought forth a spiritual philosophy. Lord Kepri brought, came forth in the creation. He came out of the ocean, the, the primeval ocean, on his boat, pushing the sun this along. This is the, the hieroglyphic text that means Kepri, or to create, creator. And this is Kepri in his boat again, being adored by the initiate Annie and his wife. The lineage of Shatana Tur is as follows. This is Lord Kepri. Remember I told you he brought forth a spiritual philosophy. That spiritual philosophy was written down by Lord Jehuti. Lord Jehuti is the one that the Greeks call Hermes. He's a scribe of the gods and goddesses. Lord Kepri taught that teaching to Goddess Heheru. And he also taught that teaching to Asar and Aset. That teaching was taught by Aset to her son Heru. And that teaching is given forth through the Benunetur that Jehuti wrote for the priests and priestesses to practice and follow. That is the lineage that is given by the Shatana Tur scriptures themselves. So ultimately everything goes back to God who gave the scripture. And it was written down. Jehuti in the in the, in the mythological sense, Jehuti represents mind. And mind, or intellect, is what you use to cognize the spiritual teaching. But this spiritual teaching that was brought forward by Kepri, that was codified by Jehuti, was also, shall we say, organized by Lord Asar, Osiris. He is the one who organized it into a form of worship of the gods and goddesses. So it, the, it, how it is explained is that creator, Ra, Ra, Harak, Ra, Kepri, Kepri Ra, and for a fourth spiritual philosophy, but Jehudi codified it, and Lord Asar transformed it into a spiritual philosophy that can be practiced. The, the worship program, how to, to worship the gods and goddesses. And that is what is called Shatam Natur, the mysteries. Shatam Natur, this is the hieroglyphic text that means Shatav. Sheta, Ut, and that means secret or hidden or mysterious. And this means Neter. Neter means divinity. It does not mean God or Goddess. It means divinity in the androgynous sense. It means, if you will, the God or the male and female principles when they come together or before they separate, shall we say. And this term is is the, or the symbol, is the abbreviation of the longer term Neter or Neger. See, many, many people are pronouncing it Neger or Neter. So either way is, um, is acceptable. So this, uh, what is called religion, is in our terms, the hidden divine. That's a, that's a literal translation. Who are the Neterians? 
those who follow Shaitan Atur are called Natarians, just like those who follow Christianity are called Christians, who follow Buddhism are called Buddhists. And this term here means Shems. Shems means to follow. And what are you following? You're following better. You're following God. You're following divinity. <coughs> so if you decide to adopt Shetanatur, you become an Eternal. If somebody wants to ask you, what religion do you, you, you meet a, a Buddhist, they say, oh, I follow Buddhism. You, you would say, I follow Eternalism. And I, I'm an Eternal. That's what you would say. That's what our, our uh, congregation, if you want to use that word, of the temple says. Is there any downward dog? Excuse me? Uh, on that symbol, you look like it was a downward dog, and you know that thing that. What the name of the Do the uh, page, page pop. See if we go for that one. There it is. There. This? Yes. This, this is a um, symbol of stepping, of walking. And you can have um, uh, a look which means follow. You're following behind, you're moving behind. If the symbol was turned backwards, it means that you're turning away from. This means you're moving towards, you're going towards the energy. Materialism, like any other, or I say, like 99% of African religion, is related to a system of understanding divinity in two formats. This is the this is one of the fundamental principles I talked about two nights ago about African religion. All African religion sees divinity as being one, as being supreme, but manifesting as lower divinities as gods and goddesses. Those gods and goddesses are cosmic powers. And they all emanate, like sun rays, from that one divinity. But that divinity cannot be approached directly, because you have to be initiated and you have to prepare yourself for that encounter. In order to do that, the gods and goddesses, by following their teaching, by following their example, by working through virtuous practice, learning the disciplines of mind to cleanse yourself, to purify yourself, and become ultimately like them. If you become one of them, you have direct access. And that is what materialism is all about. And that's really what all African religion is all about. But what the problem here with that is that much of African religion has been damaged through the slave trade, through the colonialism, through the destruction of, of symbols and uh, the purveyors of the spiritual teaching in African tradition. The griots, the, the tribal leaders, and this is where the distortion, much distortion has come through. And the beauty of Kemetic theology is that we, we have scripture which is not as vulnerable or volatile as oral tradition. If you kill a griot, you kill the, the lineage, you kill. If, if we write a bunch of books, a bunch of papara, and we spread them all around, if you destroy one, then we still have a lot more to go. And even with the onslaught of the Catholic Church, which tried to destroy all these things, all that still remains. You see that the, the, the proliferation of it, how much it was. These are the main gods and goddesses. These are some of the main gods and goddesses. We don't have details to go into it, but... Divinity in Unitarian iconography is important to understand that divinity, the gods and goddesses, man, these are, it's not, nothing to do with relating to the Supreme Being now. We're not even dealing with that at this, at this juncture. We much work and philosophy and inner, inner meditation and certain disciplines need to be practiced in order to have entry into that, into that higher realm. We're dealing with the lower divinities now. 
You can have manifestations in several different ways. Hit it one more time. This right here is what we call a composite iconography. This is the god Haru, the one who was taught by Aset. Aset was taught by a <coughs> Remember that we talked about before, a few slides ago? When he grew up, he has the head of a hawk and the body of a man and the crown of a king. Here is the goddess Head Heru in her cow form, and here's the god Heru in a full, what we call zoomorphic form, animal form. This is the goddess Aset in a composite form. She is an avian divinity like Heru, but also she has a female human body as well. And this is Amun. And he is, he is fully anthropomorphic, fully uh, humanized. So I have the time to go into the details of all the iconographies and everything, but I'll show you some basic insight into what we're doing, what it's all about. Another important feature that you have to understand is that a full practice of religion involves three steps. If you are missing any of these steps, you are not going to have the full benefit of your religious practice. Your religious practice is not going to be effective, in other words. First of all, you must have a myth, the mantra, the legend, the teaching. That gives you the story of the divinities, like the creation that tells you how creation came into being, tells you who created creation, how you came into being, it relates you to your culture, it relates you to your your land, where, you, where your people come from, and so on. So you see that if you live by someone else's myth, you're going to be related to someone else's culture, someone else's land, holy land, someone else's ideals of life, someone else's values. Follow me? Next stage of practice of religion is ritual. You must have a ritual that makes your myth effective in your life. Remember a couple nights ago I talked about the, the mass ritual in Christianity. But actually they took that from the Kemetic Asarian tradition. Because we were practicing, we go back to the 5000 BC with the pyramid text, and you see there the Eucharist is there, the offering of wine and bread, the resurrection of Asar is propitiated, to the offering. Asar becomes one with divinity by eating that offering. And that is what's supposed to happen in the ritual. Just as it happened in the myth. Asar was resurrected in the myth, so you are to be resurrected as well. You have to become Asar. If that happens, that is called a mystical awakening. And that is the fulfillment of Shaitan Eter. And the myth is given through Sejet, storytelling. And this is the same tradition of what we call the Griot in other parts of Africa. But here, this role will be fulfilled through the priesthood. And Shensu. So once the teaching is given, the teaching is followed. This is the most important myth of Shaitanata, the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru. And this is Asar, as I said, this is Heru, you saw him earlier. This is his brother Set, which I'm sure some of you have been hearing about, the, the Sethian, the Sethian uh, divinity. And I can say many things about that, but we're, we're, we're going to move forward. Essentially, Asar, and Aset, and Heru, Asar, Aset, and Set were brought forth as incarnations to lead human beings on the righteous path. But Set got greedy, he got jealous of Asar, and he killed him. And then he took the throne, and then Aset raised Heru with the spiritual teaching, and Asar came to him also in spirit form and urged him to make a fight against Set to establish righteousness, righteousness and order and truth in the land. 
and the same story you see later on in, uh, in other other stories of Western culture, like Hamlet, it's the same story over again. Uh, the Star Wars <laughs> trilogy is based on the same philosophy. Lion King. Yeah. And Lion King, yes. Another one. And the story of how Peru grows up, he receives a special teaching from Aset, who received it from Cheruti, who received it from who? Gabriel. That is the story of the Sun Resurrection, how he eventually, eventually defeats Set and becomes the king and brings righteousness and order and truth to the land. But the deeper mystery is that you are to become, you are that same Peru. You are that same Asar who's been murdered and you need to be redeemed through Peru. But telling you this is, is, is no the mystery, but working it out philosophically and spiritually and metaphysically, that is the, the key of the philosophy we're talking about. And that has no relationship to Cain and Abel. Let's leave that for now. <laughs> this is the, and the, the, the really wonderful thing of the, the Kinetic, the Netarian. Kemetic relates to, to the land. Or you say Kemetic that relates to the land. Kemet, Egypt. Or you say Netarian that relates to the spirituality. Just you uh, don't see know what terms are we using. Is that, it is very wonderful that when you, when you read the scriptures and the myths, uh, you can actually go to the temple, the ancient temple of that divinity. If I, if you were asked to go to to the temple of the ancient temple of Krishna. There is no ancient temple of Krishna that you go that was built in you know 2500 BC or 5000 BC and that kind of thing. Those divinities came in through the Upanishadic age, through the first millennium BC and that kind of thing. And you may find some icons and symbols related to those periods. But here, you can actually go to the Temple of Asar, you can go to the Temple of Asar, you can go to the Temple of Peru, of Peru, and you can see all, all this, this teaching laid out and played out as well. And this, what I'm getting at is that this is a living teaching, a teaching that was practiced and lived and reenacted. And that is what Shinsu, to get a deeper sense, really means. It means to enact to enact the practice so that you can become like those things you are you're acting like. This is the Temple of Asset, and these are places you can go and visit today. Those of you who may have gone, it's the Temple of Peru. And these, these are, are really just awesome places to go, even today. Go stand next to the columns and, and, and let it dwarf you so you can see the glory of, of and these are people like I said, they had all the capacity to do anything they wanted, build anything they wanted, and they built temples and pyramids and architecture that transforms the mind and which collects certain energies to transform you and transform you and elevate you come in consciousness. They didn't build uh, uh, you know, icons towards to, to glorify business or to glorify uh, someone else's culture. They were not interested in those things. The ultimate goal of the Vegetarian culture is the Hans. The Hans means a spiritual awakening. And this is from the papyrus of Annie. This is Annie who is now in the form of resurrected Asar. He's Coming up, he's getting up out of the coffin. Lifting himself out of the coffin. And these are the sons of Heru. The living is known as the sons of Heru, which help ESR to attain resurrection. And that is the goal of all human beings. That is what the Buddhists call enlightenment. Is what actually the Christians are trying to say when they say the kingdom of heaven. Is what the Taoists mean by the Tao. This is what what is actually behind it. See, but just because you have some of these things being 
talked about doesn't mean that you can that, that you can actually effectively reach that in, 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 through any of through, through any particular system. In order for that, remember we need three things: an authentic philosophy. What else? You have to be an authentic aspirant. Now this is an important icon. These two divinities, this is Peru, and this is, uh, remember I told you that they had a battle <coughs> for the throne of Egypt, and Seth ultimate, or uh, Peru ultimately beat Seth. When he beat Seth, they made peace with each other. And the peace is symbolized by the symbol of the smile. And I believe some other, some, another speaker was earlier talking about or using the symbol, and they call this a shovel. And I do not agree with that, that assessment. This is, this is in, in any kind of, of uh, study of the hieroglyphic text, for you to approximate a meaning, I'm not, I do agree with one part, talking about how some Egyptologists, especially European Egyptologists, have come through with certain translations based on their own points of view or their own culture, so on and so forth, and they have made some distortions. I do agree with that. However, in this, in determining the meaning of certain icons and symbols, just because something looks like something else, does you cannot say. A, uh, immediately that that is, uh, that is a, uh, a final determination. Some items you can say directly that uh, this looks like a hawk, and I think everyone will agree that there's, there's no... But, see this symbol the way it's written here, and I took this out of the, out of the budget book also. This is how the, the British Museum, at about the turn of the century, transpose the original symbol of the SEMA. But this is the original symbol of the SEMA. And here clearly you can see two lumps and you can see the trachea. There's no there's no doubt about that. So I'm saying that you have to do further researches in order to, to get the, the correct determination. Furthermore, the determination is also made by the contextual use of symbolism. And uh, it might be a little technical. You have to, you, many people get into uh, comparative religious studies. You find this goes on a lot in colleges. And I've been through that to some degree, so I can say with some authority some of the things I understand. The symbol sma means unity through, through oneness coming from the two united. That is what the sma is all about. It's not about the uh, shovel. This symbol here may look like a shovel the way it's written, but you will not find this in scripture looking like this. This is a transposed. So I'm saying, if we're going to look at the transposed figure and try to determine what that is, that will give us an erroneous determination. I think it's the original. In any case, let's move forward. This term, Sima Tawi, or Smai Tawi, means unity of the two lands. Unity of the two lands can have two meanings. When it's being discussed, it can mean when you're uniting with the earth, which means that when you die, the very you can push you in the earth. Or it can mean Sima Peruset, which means the unity of Peru and Set. And this is supported because the, the literature itself says that Peru and Seb represent the higher and the lower Egypt. And we know that Peru is the higher self and Seb is the lower self. So unity of the higher and the lower self. See how we get that? And this is what the Indians call, what the Indians call unity of the higher and lower self. They call it yoga. Yoga means to unite the higher and lower is the same teaching. 
being, is being brought forth in, in India as well. That's what the, this is why we call it Egyptian yoga. Egyptian means the land, and the Sima means yoga. That's how that's why we use that term. So if you translate to English, you have Sima Tali means Egyptian yoga. Any questions about that? Uh, a lot of questions there. Yeah, anyway, I want to be clear on that. Okay? You're going to find that I'm not going to be giving you uh, terminologies and, and relationships between words and linguistics that I cannot back up and actually show you. I know some of, some of the speakers have come and they have said certain things and they sound really good. You need to see it and you need to, to have the, the basis and the, and the research shown to you. You, you don't need, I think we've had enough of people drawing connection between things and connecting dots between different things without showing the basis for these things. And all my books will, will be that way. You'll find evidences and you'll find it documented. You can even go into the temples and go see these things yourself. Okay? So these two divinities represent Sima Tawi. This is a symbol for Ta, which means land. Land. And this is Sima. So Sima Ta We, which means two lands. Union of two lands. And furthermore, how do we know that, that this teaching relates to a unity of these two divinities? Because the, the scripture themselves show us this iconography. Really, that battle between these two divinities is not a historical battle. It is a battle of the higher and the lower self within you. And if Heru wins that battle, you attain the house. If Seth wins that battle, that battle degradation and death. The other thing that I want to give you is that Set, set does not represent a devil. Set does not represent uh, a, a does not represent the Asiatic peoples. Set actually is a divinity that existed in Egypt long before the Hyksos came in to to uh, to attack and conquer the country. They Set was ascribed to them because that's how they acted. Set is the egoistic nature of a human being. Anger, hatred, greed, lust, jealousy, envy. Anyone who is setian is associated with set divinity. And it is that anger, hatred, and greed that kills your own divinity, that kills your soul, Asar. Asar needs to be resurrected within you through your room. The son redeems the father. Hence, this is this is where the simplicity of where the Christians bring forth the teaching of Jesus. But Jesus, just by believing in Jesus, just by praising Jesus, that's not going to lead you to enlightenment. You have to become Jesus like or Christ like. And Karas, the term Karas is the term for each Egypt that means to, to attain the anointing. But, it's all laid out in the books for you. This is the symbol of Neturti, which means the two eyes. There's something else I put in there. The two eyes of, of Ra. And some, some ways to explain as the sun and moon. Also, these two characters represent the two eyes. The eyes of the higher and lower self, the sun and the moon. But that's a different teaching. We'll go through more than that. Now to give you insight into what uh, are the disciplines of Shedi. If you want to become an Atarian, what does it mean to become an Atarian? What should you be doing as an Atarian follower? There are four main aspects or disciplines that you need to be concerned with. If you come here thinking that you're going to get some books and you're going to gain some knowledge. You're going to get some videos. You're going to get a consultation with someone and you're going to be led to that great spiritual awakening that we're talking about. That 
immortality that goes beyond death at time and space. You're sadly mistaken. If you think that you're going to, because you have a, a high intellect, I know some of you have great intellect, some of you read dozens of books, or you've read hundreds of books, or whatever. I, I, I read more than you, trust me. <laughs> I have a full library full of, 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 of books, and of books, and books, and all the researches. And that hubris, I would even call it, that I, that I had at that time, prevented me from truly entering into the divine realms of what the books were talking about. Without humility, you will not progress. That's one thing. Without virtue, you will not progress. With egoism, you will not progress. And so, learning the wisdom teaching Though it is a beginning point, is not the end point of spiritual philosophy. You also have to practice virtue, and this is why the, the laws of Maha were created. Also, you need to practice devotion to the divine, like you practiced last night. For those of you who were here last night, you saw that. I didn't just come here to do lectures to you. We practiced music, we did singing, we did chant, to open the heart to the spiritual philosophy. If you do not do that, all your wisdom is going to become dry intellectualism. And if you're like those kind of first people who like to go to church all the time, go to church every day, shout hallelujah, and jump up and down, and you don't study any spiritual philosophy, you don't try to transform yourself into a virtuous person, you're not going to transform either. That's what's called blind faith. Fanaticism. If you do not practice introspection, meditation, at some point all that stuff has to lead you to peace and introspectiveness. If you do not stop talking at some point, if you do not stop moving around all the time, you will not progress either. The waters of your consciousness have to come to stillness. That's called meditation. Kevin, it has the oldest recorded meditation, a formal meditation system in history, before it was practiced in India. And we talk about it, it's called the Glorious Light System. We have a book that's written about that as well. So these are the four basic disciplines. Why? Because you have four main aspects of your personality that need to be enlightened, that need to be cultivated. Not just your intellect, that's one of them. Your emotions have to be purified. Your feelings have to be purified. Your actions in the world have to be purified. And practicing meditation gives you the will to go forth, to break through fear, and mental agitation to go beyond the realm of time and space. But meditation is supported by all these other disciplines. You, you cannot practice one without the other. And those who do so are sadly mistaken, greatly mistaken. Those who do this will go in a circle, what I call uh, horizontal movement. They'll go from book to book. Let me get this other book. Let me get this other book. Maybe the answer will be this one. Maybe the answer will be this one. Or maybe go to this philosophy. Maybe do the other one. That's like digging digging, uh, like I like to say, digging uh, shallow wells, not digging one deep one. So if you're choosing, you look, coming here to choose a spiritual philosophy to follow, something to elevate you, choose well. And look, and I'm telling you to choose Shaitana Tara, but realize the wisdom of the way I'm talking about what needs to occur in your spiritual life in order for you to be successful. Apply that same standard to other traditions and see what passes those standards and then make your decision.